This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, welcome everybody. Can you hear me all right in the back there? Yes. Uh, welcome to all of you. Some of you were here at some of the earlier sessions, uh, and some of you have joined us for this one, and that's great. And welcome back to Salman Rushdie, who you've all heard of, and uh, he's sitting right here. Uh, this is his, his eighth year coming, uh, coming back here. And uh, as the author of novels, screenplays, essays, memoirs, uh, Salman Rushdie has stretched the boundaries of all of these genres. He has given his prose the musicality and cadences of Urdu and Hindi. He, writing in English, he has indeed confirmed English as an Indian language. <laughs> and it's to, it's to that question of English that I want to turn uh, to uh, in today's program. And I want to start with a quote by uh, Srinivas Arvamudan, who is a professor of English at Duke University of Indian origin. And the beginning of his book, which is entitled Guru English, South Asian Religion in a Cosmopolitan Language. He says, it's a truism universally acknowledged that English dominates the globe today as no language has in the recorded history of humanity. And he continues to say, English dominates by virtue of its stranglehold on global organizations as an international auxiliary or link language. And he says, uh, I'm skipping sentences here a little bit. Um, a comparison of the current dominance of English with that of other languages at different times leads to the discovery that empires and religions have been the two most obvious vehicles of linguistic universalism. And he compares uh, English to some extent with Latin and Arabic have been uh, languages that have, because of religion and empire in one way or another, have had historically uh, wide reach. And uh, uh, just one quick uh, quote. He says, it's not merely the political dispensation at hand that ensures English supremacy at this point. The cultural and technical vocabularies of science and technology, capitalist business economics, and television and media have instituted an even more important role for English to play as the ultimate knowledge base from which other languages can be launched or situated in relation to one another. And the third largest group of English language speakers are in India. And uh, so there, uh, we can skip over how English got to India originally and how it evolved, but I uh, want to just conclude uh, because I want to uh, ask uh, Salman Rushdie <laughs> to kind of uh, take it from here. Uh, Arvind Mutton says, it's only in recent decades that greater attention is being paid by the literati to the imaginative and innovative function of cultural production supported by dialectical as well as political independence. Post-independence writers from G.V. Dasani to Salman Rushdie, it's right here in the book, <laughs> and Indian cinema and media have since disseminated an Indian English dialect with regional variants that has gone global and is in its quest for new markets and audiences. So my first question to you, sir, mm -hmm. is to uh, comment on English since that's uh, the language you write it. Well, you know, one thing to say about India is that, that also entrenches English is that the, the law is in English. You know, the, 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 the penal code is in English. And as everyone knows, if you translate the law, you change the law. Right. You know, any lawyer will tell you that. You know? <laughs> um, so that's a very entrenched situation. The Constitution is in English. You know? um, I myself was not at all convinced, as a young writer, I was not at all convinced that English would remain a literary language in India um, in the aftermath of, of, of you know, the post-colonial moment. Um, I thought it was entirely possible that it would no longer be interesting to Indian writers to express themselves in English and that the um, many other languages of India would be the languages in which literature would proceed. You know, and I, but, I mean, I, that's to say, when I was 
writing Midnight's Children. I mean, I had, you know, at that time I had very little expectation of anything more than just publication. You know, I mean, I had no, no sense of what that book might, what, what happened to that book, you know, was something that I could not have, have anticipated. But I did think maybe I'm at the end of something, not at the beginning mm. of something. You know, uh, uh, and, uh, and I remember going to India after the book came out. Can you all hear? Is that right? Um, going to India soon after the book came out and, and being asked by people what other Indian writers of my generation I liked. And the truth was, and I was tr not trying to be a smart house, but I couldn't think of any. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, uh, I, mean, I could think of writers older than myself. I could think of writers like, you know, Anita Desai and Narayan and Vesani and Mulk Rajana and then Raja Rao and, you know, even occasionally Khushwan Singh. Um, <laughs> very occasionally. Very occasionally. <laughs> um, but, you know, in my own generation, mm -hmm. looking around, I just genuinely... You know, I saw a kind of empty landscape, and that's why I, I thought maybe this isn't going to continue, you know. And then, of course, what happened was what happened, this extraordinary uh, explosion of writing in English. Um, and, and what I like about it now is how, how varied and diverse that explosion. I mean, you know, for there to be a healthy literature, mm -hmm. there, have, there has to be a large diversity in forms of writing. You know, and uh, and now you have everything from very arcane literary production to very very demotic popular fiction. You know, you have science fiction, you have schlock fiction, you have Fifty Shades of Chetan Bhagat. You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, at one end and kind of Amit Chaudhary at the other. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and kind of everything in between. And that seems to me to, to demonstrate the health of the literature, when, when there is not just one kind of production, you know, um, not just kind of high literary fiction, but everything. Mm -hmm. And even high literary fiction of many different kinds. You know, uh, no real agreement in how the subject should be approached. And I think maybe the last thing that's happening that needs to happen for the literature to be fully developed is that Indian writers no longer feel the need always to write about India. You know, so you have a writer like Rana Dasgupta, who I think is one of the most talented of the younger writers. And you know, his first book was called Tokyo Cancelled mm -hmm. and took place in airline lounges outside India. His second book was about Bulgaria. You know, and only now, after being quite established as a writer, has he written a non-fiction book about, about his hometown, about Delhi, um, which is his new book. Um, but that idea, you know, Western writers always gave themselves the liberty to write about anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, Fitzgerald could set a novel on the Riviera. You know, Hemingway could write about Spain. Um, nobody said that they were deracinated. You know, they didn't, they didn't stop being American writers mm. because they didn't write about America. You know, whereas for a long time, there was a kind of spoken or unspoken pressure on Indian writers to write about India. You know, and, and if not, what are you playing at? You know, um, I mean, Updike wrote one of the worst novels ever written about Africa, uh, The Coup. <laughs> Um, been spared that one, <laughs> um, but you know, and it's 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 an imaginary African country in which there's a coup, and believe me, don't read it. Uh, <laughs> um, Bello could write Henderson the Rain King, you know, set in an African country. Uh, it never occurred to them not to, mm -hmm. if that's the idea that they wanted to pursue, and I think it's the last freedom that Indian literature has to give itself. It's just that same freedom, you know, write about wherever you want, write about whatever you want. You don't have to write about your hometown and the people who live next door, mm. you know. Um, so I think that's, it's been very interesting seeing, you know, Midnight's Children was what, 1981. So it's, we're talking about three and a half decades, really, in which this literature has grown and matured in very interesting ways, I think. Yeah. And now Pakistan as well. For a long time, Pakistani writer, uh, writing in English 
kind of lag behind. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I mean, there are a few writers of the current course, there are a few people, but uh, but now suddenly in this younger generation, there's a an enormous number of very very gifted Pakistani writers in English. You know, Muhammad Hanif, Daniel Muinuddin, Kamil Ashamsi, Nadim Aslam, a uh, whole range of them. You know, and and. Interest, one thing I think is interesting is that the Pakistani writers, these ones I've just mentioned, many of them are still writing what you might call public fiction, you know, where they take on subjects to do with the public life of, of the country. Um, maybe because in Pakistan that's just so in your face that you have to deal with it, you know. Um, the Indian writers of their generation, the younger, seem to be a little bit turning away from the public project. You know, and writing uh, books which are less political, less assertive of a of a of a view of society, and more a more private kind of fiction. You know, it just seems to be. I mean, fiction has fashion like everything else. You know, it has mood swings and tendencies. It goes this way and that way. But at this moment, it seems that it's Pakistan from which the more political fiction is coming, and India from where the less political fiction is coming. Um, which wasn't, I mean, didn't used to be the case. Yeah. So it's a sign of the, that the residue of colonialism is, is fading as I Indians write about things other than India. Yeah, yeah, I just think, you know, it's a really long time ago, the British Empire. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I don't feel post-colonial. <laughs> you, know? you don't look post-colonial. I feel post-post-colonial. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got to that next point. Yes. I don't find, you know, you go to India now, nobody's talking about the British Empire. You know, nobody's thinking about the British Empire. Um, it's gone, uh, except that it left behind this, this gift of the language. You know, and and uh, I do think that English is a great gift. I think it's a it's a it's a it's a remarkable language because of because it's so malleable. You know, you you can much more so than, for instance, French, which is just syntactically and in all sorts of ways much more classicist and rigid, mm. you know. Uh, English lets you twist it and turn it and it doesn't break, you know. So, th and that's, I think, other than all those excellent reasons which you read for the dominance of English, mm. the other reason is how flexible it is, mm. you know. So, that the Irish can make an Irish English. Right. You know, Australians can make an Australian English. Caribbean people can make a Caribbean English. Americans, of course, have made many different kinds of English. You know, there's a, the, the English of African Americans, the English of the South, the English, you know, there's, yeah. there's a whole range of Englishes available in America. So, an English has allowed that. You know, it's been capacious and malleable enough to permit people to find the way to express themselves in English that feels like them, right. you know? And I think India is a little bit late to the party, mm -hmm. to tell you the truth. You know, I think all, many of these other English literatures are much older, mm -hmm. much better established. There's been Irish English, you know, for, since right. the 18th century, right. you know? Uh, and so I think that's, that's another reason why English has has managed to take such root. You know, it is, yes, of course, it's to do with, mm -hmm. you know, all those things. <laughs> right. um, what he it, said. But it, yeah, what he said. <laughs> <laughs> that guy. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I know Srinivas, and he's very smart. And I agree with him more or less completely about what he said. But I think the, the, the other thing is that people enjoy the use of English and have been able to make English feel to them like their own thing, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so I think if you are in the West Indies listening to people speak, and they even, even Jamaica is not the same as Trinidad, you know? I mean, it's a, uh, but you, f you have people using a language which they feel is their own, you know? And I mean, Joyce said explicitly that one of his parts of his project was to liberate English from the possession of the English. Right. And, 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 and I think that, you know, the Irish would very much feel that English was their own, you know? Uh, and, and so on. So I think that India's finally joined the party. I want to shift a little from the language to the folks who write in it, mm. uh, especially in India. That is the role of the writer in uh, Indian society, 
particularly in the in the present time. Mm. The writer as a public figure, the writer as an entertainer, as a celebrity, as a provoker, as one who inspires, one that confounds the reader, um, writer as activist, writer as conscience. Uh, how do you understand? You have some experience with this. How do you understand? I mean, the that's role of really the all of that is really <laughs> Arundhati Roy. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and 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 not a whole lot of others actually, mm -hmm. because I I have the sense, not very, I mean, slightly depressing sense, that writers are not particularly listened to in India anymore. You know, I don't think anybody gives it. I mean, I'm sure we'll get round to talking about what's happening with Wendy Doniger and so on. But uh, I think that's a, it's an aspect of that, that there, we, I mean, nobody cares about these things except a small mm -hmm. group. Um, and even that small group is very conflicted and ambiguous about the way in which it deals with it. Um, so I think there's been a great loss of literary influence in India. Um, I mean, there are figures, you know, clearly who have some stature, um, like Arundhati, like Vikram Sage, like, you know, uh, the, uh, and, some, and some journalists who've been very prominent for a long time and who have a kind of prominence, a kind of voice because of that. Um, and I mean, it, it's good to see that those people do use those that position in order to, you know, to use the platform in order to say things that need to be said. Um, and I just worry that not many, not that many people are listening anymore. Mm. You know, um, not that unlike America. You know, uh, there's a great line in 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 Italo Calvino's novel, If on a Winter's Night, a Traveller. Oh, you can't hear? I, all right, let me, how about that? Is that better? All right. Um, in Calvino's novel, If on a Winter's Night, a Traveler, there's a moment where one of the characters says to another, you can always tell how highly a country values literature by the size of the apparatus it sets up to control it. Hmm. <laughs> And you know, by that standard, the Soviet Union valued literature very highly, <laughs> <laughs> um, and and the United States not so much. You know, and I think that's probably true. Yeah, that the way in which writers and intellectuals were were effective in opposing Soviet communism, you know, uh, spoke to the great regard that people had for Solzhenitsyn mm -hmm. and so on. Um, here, I have the feeling that nobody's that interested. In Europe, it goes up and down. In India, I have the sense that people aren't that interested anymore. You know, uh, the casualness I mean, of the of the attacks on the arts in India now, and the kind of broad acceptance, um, or, or let's say, the inertia of the mass of the public uh, to the fact that these things are being done. Uh, it, 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 it arouses very little outrage, mm -hmm. uh, very little commentary. There's a kind of assumption that if you've got yourself banned, it's your fault because you did something you shouldn't have. Um, it's very damaging. I think the Indian culture is, you know, I was in India last year when the film of Midnight's Children came out there, and I, I, and I, I, I said something which I think is true, that you know, the, the Midnight's Children at its climax deals with with the emergency period, you know, and of course that was a, a political emergency. Right. You know, and, and, and what I said is that now I think India is in the middle of a cultural emergency. Uh, and that the levels of repression in the cultural area, you know, should worry us as much as the political repressions of, mm -hmm. of the mid 70s emergency. Mm -hmm. But the thing that's in a way most worrying is that it doesn't worry people. Mm -hmm. There isn't enough there isn't enough concern about it. And so everybody gets away with this over and over again. I mean, this same guy, Batra, who went after Wendy Doniger, is the same guy who got Delhi University to take Ramanujan's Ramayan essay off the syllabus, the 300 Ramayans, right. which had been the core essay of the syllabus for decades. Um, so 
what is shocking is how this one pathetic individual can have such a consequence mm -hmm. without anybody just smacking him down and telling him to <laughs> go home and grow up, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, yeah, I think it's a very worrying time for culture in India. Very well, and not just writing. You know, I think the Hussain case is an example. And it's, it's not just the exile of Hussain. There was that, I forget his name, the artist, the gay artist in Delhi whose work was attacked at a gallery last year. Um, you know, so painting, scholarship, literature, cinema, you know, everything is under attack. Mm. And the government and the administration, the police force, on the whole, sides with the attackers, uh, not with the people being attacked. Mm. You know? And so if I was an Indian artist now, I would worry very deeply about the future in India. You know, I mean, Wendy Doniger is, you know, she's in Chicago, she could continue with her work. Um, I'm here, I can continue with my work. You know? um, as you may have heard, I mean, for me to go to India, it becomes very troublesome now. Yeah. You know? yeah. and and, and there's a part of me that doesn't want to go. Why would you want to go and put yourself in the middle of that garbage? Mm. You know, to be surrounded by 200 armed men. You know, I, I'm more worried about them. You know, who killed Indira Gandhi? Her bodyguard. Mm -hmm. Who killed Salman um, at Tahsir in Pakistan? Mm. His bodyguard. I don't want bodyguards. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the people... The, it's the people assigned to protect you you have to worry about, right? Yeah. <laughs> if there's 200 people around you carrying guns, the likelihood is that if there's going to be a gun used, it's going to be one of those 200 people. Mm. You know? And I would sooner they weren't around. Right. right. You know, I mean, last time I was in Bombay, friends of mine invited me to dinner. And the police, who had come at their own accord and refused to go away, even though I told them I didn't want them, said, oh, you can't go to that area. There's a lot of Muslims who live there. <laughs> and I said, look, it's my friend's house, you know, and I, you can come with me or not, but I can take a taxi. It's fine. So then they came across the street from the house. There's a hospital. The next day in the newspapers in Bombay, there was full thing, was Salman Rushdie in hospital last night? <laughs> you know, because there was this huge, you know, police bandobast outside the hospital. And the rumor is that he was sick and he was taken to this hospital. And I said to them, look, if you hadn't been there, I was just quietly having That's dinner right. with my friends. You know, the, the problem is created by you guys doing this kind of tamasha in the street, you know, to show off how big you are. So I think, for me, it's very difficult now in India, you know, and, and I feel very sad about what's happening there, genuinely, because I think this is not the country that I love. Yeah. It's not. You made the comment in your if I'm paraphrasing you reasonably closely, uh, that uh, last night in your wonderful, uh, uh, upon arrival, your wonderful uh, talk about uh, uh, stories uh, are everywhere and belong to everybody. Yeah. Uh, and following up on uh, not just, not only writers, but scholars, people who write about India, mm -hmm. about Indian stories, about Indian religions, about Indian culture. Uh, about Indian ways of life. Uh, now that everything is available to everybody 24-7, uh, do, do you sense that that creates a kind of anxiety in a way that... Uh, well, it does it, amongst people who want the stories to be in their control. Mm -hmm. you know? Because, I mean, it's true about, you know, about it's true of the Satanic Verses, it's true of Wendy Doniger's book. If you want it in India, you download it. Right. You know? So you've actually got to the point where it's impossible to ban a book. You know, it's, it's a kind of ridiculous thing to ban a book because the book can be, is always available. The only, as far as I know, the only example I've ever seen of a witty remark by an Iranian Ayatollah, <laughs> uh, I'll, I will sh uh, share with you, that this was a gentleman, I've forgotten his name, who was given the task of censoring the, the internet opposition websites in Iran. Oh, you know? right, and, right. and he would shut down a website and 10 more would come up over here and so on. It was a mug's game. And he said at one point that, it, that really it was impossible to do this. And he said, it's like removing a ladder to stop birds sitting on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
and, and, and you know, that's this, the wonderful, one of the wonderful things about the information age mm. is that you can remove the ladder, but you can't stop birds sitting on the roof. You know? So, so, so any, anybody in India who wants to read Wendy Donica's book can read it today, you know? And I gather it's, the Amazon number is 11. Yeah, I think it's... You know, and, it, and it, for a five-year-old book of religious studies by a scholar at the University of Chicago to be number 11 of all books on Amazon. It's pretty interesting. Um, it's not, uh, reveals that it's quite a good thing sometimes your book to get in trouble. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, mind, I'm mindful we're about halfway through and yeah. we now want to uh, in, open it up for your comments and uh, questions for Salman Rushdie. Uh, we have somebody with a microphone walking around. So, uh, yes. Brings politics in, and I wondered if we could get some insights from you on where you see India going politically in the next few months. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, your guess is as good as mine, but nowhere good. I mean, if the choice is, I mean, the choice is not a good one. You know, I mean, between Modi and Rahul, really? <laughs> You know, I mean, who would you vote for? I mean, I, I know who I would not vote for, um, but I mean, it's, I think, actually, truthfully, I think probably the BJP is going to be the big winner in the election, and and uh, and whether and therefore will very possibly form the next government. And I find the prospect very worrying indeed to have Narendra Modi as <coughs> Prime Minister of India. Um, but that seems like what's going to happen. And I think some of the stuff that's going on now, things like these, these Hindu actions now, I mean, imagine what it's going to be like when the BJP is the government. <coughs> you know? uh, so it's, it's as worrying as it can be. You know? But on the other hand, Congress has such dirty hands as well um, that you can't really see them as the good guys. And I don't know what will happen with you know, the AAP and all the par parties like that. I mean, it's a, a, I don't know, it's very new. The AAP is, you know, well organized in Delhi and did a very good job and so on. I mean, how, how well or badly it can translate that onto a national scale, I mean, I, I have no idea, really, you know. Um, and even if it did, it would be unlikely ever to be a majority party. And so then it's the question is, the coalition game comes into, into play and, and uh, I don't know. It's a, a, but I mean, the specter of Modi, I think, is a very real one now. Yeah. Hi, my name is Justin. I'm a junior in the college. I just want to ask you, uh, talking about cultural emergency, I saw a very comparable um, parallel that happens in China because uh, both India and China emerging uh, economics, uh, 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 emerging countries in Asia, but as people are trying to pursue material wealth and they're losing their identities from their culture and who they are uh, in the face of Western trends and fashions. So how do you think young writers today in India uh, can pursue their dreams and cultural identities in this wave? Well, you know, I think uh, I don't have a, I'm not worried about the writers themselves. I think there's a, there's a lot of very fine and serious writers working in India, you know, who are doing what you suggest that they should. I don't, you know, the problem is not that. The problem is uh, of a larger a trend in the culture which dislikes some of the things that literature has always been about. Literature is about breaking rules. You know, it's, a, it's about not doing the conventional thing. You know, it, it, it's about pushing boundaries. Uh, it's about taking risks, finding new ways to do things that haven't been done before. And yes, it can be about satire, it can be about sarcasm, it can be destructive, it doesn't have to be constructive. You know, literature is not always about positive things. You know, you can't just tell us a nice story, <laughs> you know. That's not what it's about. Literature at its best has always challenged a society, uh, not just described it. You know, um, and that challenge is a valuable one. You know, sometimes 
it can be a very useful thing in a society for writers, intellectuals, to ask questions which force people to look at things they don't want to look at, you know, and to, to have conversations they don't want to have. Um, and it's, it's just one of the ways in which a society moves forward. You know, there are many ways, but that's one of the ways. Now, to suddenly say that literature must not do that, it must behave itself or else, that does something very worrying. Uh, and, and as in the case of the, of the Donager book, <coughs> there is this very worrying part of the, of the penal code which makes it a criminal offense, a criminal offense, uh, to intentionally outrage religious feelings. Now, intentionally is a weasel word. Mm. You know, it's, it's very, very difficult to prove intent. You know, um, and if, as it's interpreted, simply doing the thing proves that you intended to do it, then you're ipso facto guilty. You know, so, so all that has to happen is somebody with a religious inclination stands up, points a finger, and says, my religion is offended by that. And by his accusation, you are guilty. Mm -hmm. you know? And the penal code doesn't allow you to defend yourself. There's no defense. Um, and this is why, really, I think Penguin threw in the towel, because mm -hmm. they were advised there's no way you can win the case. You know? Because the way the law is written, uh, you will lose the case. Uh, what is, so that's worrying in itself that the law is like that. What, is, what compounds that is that in case after case after case, the people held responsible for, the people blamed have been the people under attack. Mm -hmm. you know? So in this case, the, the, that ridiculous accusation by Batra that we've all read with mm -hmm. the kind of absurd language, you know, <laughs> you know to see. You know to see. Right. <laughs> it is a new one on me, but yeah. I think that uh, I want to use it. It's a good title or something. Yes. It'll <laughs> appear in your next novel. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, anyway, but in it, he clearly threatens violence. Yeah. He says, if you do not withdraw this book, we will commit acts of violence. Now, what should happen is that the police go around and arrest him mm -hmm. for, for threatening violence. That's what should happen. Instead, the police hold Penguin responsible for the violence that someone else is threatening. Right. You know? Yeah. Uh, and that's how cockeyed it's become. Uh, nobody defends the right of people to say things that other people may not like. Mm -hmm. And if we have to never say something that somebody else doesn't like, nothing can be said. Nothing can be said. Because everything that someone says will offend somebody else. Mm. Just, I mean, it's, uh, plenty of things are said which offend me. <laughs> <laughs> He's looking at me, did you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I could give you a list. <laughs> but, you know, this is just ordinary life right. in a free society. Mm. People say things you don't like. So what? You know, so what? I mean, I remember just before, yeah, just towards the end of the last pope, the person who I'm now told we should call X Benedict. <laughs> um, <laughs> 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 uh, not my joke, but I'm no, happy, it's, to, it's happy, to, happy to steal it. <laughs> um, there was a cartoon in, 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 I think it was, I mean, like the New York Post or somewhere, which showed the pope ex-Benedict Pope, and, and a group of cardinals around him, and he's looking at a computer, desktop computer, and on the computer there's pictures of little boys. And the caption says, yes, and then you just click on the boy you like. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's the Pope, right? right? And it's fairly disrespectful. Mm. Right? Nobody burned the world down. You know, uh, people read it, laughed, didn't laugh, were offended, were not offended, got on with their day. You know, that's how it works in a free society. You, know, you, you, you don't expect people to only agree with you. you know? I mean, actually, I think Wendy Donegas' book, which I read five years, four years ago, is an extraordinary book. I mean, it's not just 
not awful, it's actually exceptional. <laughs> you know? uh, and she is a scholar of the very first rank, you know, mm. as was A.K. Ramanujan, right. you know, and, and as is the 300 Ramayan essays. It's a brilliant essay, you know. And if what is now happening is the very finest scholarship that is being done is being kicked out because some jerk says it should, then Indian culture is in real danger. It's in, and as we know, the BJP already has this project to rewrite the textbooks. Mm. You know? and, and if that project succeeds, then children will be brought up believing garbage to be the truth. Mm. You know, I mean, I can remember reading the textbooks that used to exist that the British left. You know? And those textbooks were full of garbage. And then there was this moment, you know, in the 50s when the British textbooks were thrown out and the Indian, and suddenly we realized that Tipu Sultan wasn't a villain, he was a hero, mm -hmm. you know, and, and all that, you know, the rewriting of Indian history to take the colonial emphasis out of it was valuable, mm -hmm. you know, but now here's another project to rewrite the textbooks to fill them with lies again, you know, and, and that's going to be the government of India, mm -hmm. you know. If I believed in God, I would say, God help us. <laughs> but unfortunately, he's not available <laughs> on account of not existing. That's right. <laughs> Here's a, oh, you got uh, First off, big fan. Thank you for being Thank here. You. Um, you referred to having the different types of English in the world, the Irish English, the Australian English, whatnot. Um, in terms of Indian English literature, do you think the liberal use of I don't know whether it's liberal, but I'm thinking specifically of Amitav Ghosh's trilogy where he, for instance, he refers to uh, being pregnant as having a roti in the chula. Do you think such oh, things, did he? Uh. yeah, instead of a bun in the oven. That's quite good for um, Amitav Ghosh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you think that detracts from Indian literature, Indian English literature gaining wide, widespread attention? No, you know, I mean, it's, it's interesting this because uh, what do you do when there are many languages in your head. You know, when, 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 like in India, essentially nobody is monoglot. You know, everybody to some degree is polyglot. You know, and, and in many cases, people speak several languages, you know, to some level of efficiency. So there's never just one noise in your head. There's always a number of noises in your head. And, and, and you're trying to, to use that. Now, there are other literatures which have done this before. I mean, actually, I, I remember I was saying to students in another class earlier that I remember as a young man beginning to read uh, and being very affected by the post-war literature, which is of the of basically North, Northeastern American Jewish American literature. So Roth, Bellow, Malamud, writers like this. And, uh, and noticing the very liberal use of Yiddish, untranslated, unexplained, uh, peppering the text. You know? um, I thought, well, if they can do it, I can do it. <laughs> um, I mean, I, 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 you know, the, all of those books use Yiddish expressions as though the reader would understand, which maybe in the narrow world, the reader would understand. You know, in, in the wider world, the reader would not. You know? I think in Portnoy, there's a line in which the narrator refers to being given a zetz in the kishkas. And I thought, excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then it becomes clear from context that some kind of injury has taken place. So, so, <laughs> so, 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 so a zetz is clearly some kind of a blow, you know, but kishkas, where are they? <laughs> I mean, I have a number of theories, but when you <laughs> like me. But, <laughs> but, but uh, and so I thought, well, okay, that's kind of fun to be able to leaven a language with other things like that. I mean, I think when it's done well, I mean, I haven't read the Amitav Ghosh book, but when, it, when it's done well, you can more or less make clear from context what is intended. Yeah. That you may not know the swear word, but you know it's a swear word, mm -hmm. you know? You may not know it refers to pregnancy specifically, but that it that the context of the sentence makes it clear that you are saying that somebody's pregnant. You, know? you don't know that it's the literal meaning of the phrase. You don't know that it means that it is you know, a bun in the oven. You know? <laughs> but, but you know enough to, to get it. You know? And 
I think that's, I mean, it's always a decision when you use an untranslated word in a text, you know, um, and you just have to make a judgment about whether you're giving the reader, the non-language speaking reader, enough to not put them off, I think, you know. Um, and I think you do it sometimes, I mean, I've, in, I've written several books in which I haven't done that at all, because it didn't seem to be appropriate for the language I was using in that book. You know, um, and, and in other books where I'm trying to write a kind of more demotic kind of street speech language, you know, then you feel, well, that's how people talk. People talk jumbling up languages, you know, and, and you have to give at least a hint of that in the way you describe their dialogue. So, but I don't know, it's just a, you have, it, there's no rule, you know, you just, it's just a, a judgment call every time and you can get it right or wrong. Paul, for those of us who are not completely familiar with the uh, Wendy incident, I wonder if you could tell us what it was she wrote that turned out to be so offensive. And if, if well, it's not, uh, I seem to recall that it, at some point this happened to you too. Yeah, I have a little. <laughs> <laughs> well, Other people have noticed pop. that. Yeah, yeah, different, <laughs> different, different gang, <laughs> same problem. Um, no, essentially, I mean, I put this very short, so this is, you know, because her book is, a, you know, it's this thick. Um, but essentially what she's trying to do, and explicitly she says so, is to rescue Hinduism from the distortions of Hinduism placed upon it by, Hindu, by the Hindu nationalist movement. You know? um, and you could say that, that, that what Hindu nationalism of the BJP, Shiv Sena kind, RSS kind, has done is to make three falsifications of Hinduism. You know, one is, Hinduism has no collective act of worship. You, know, you, 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 you go and perform your puja whenever you feel like it. You, know, uh, you don't have to go to the temple. You don't have to, you, you know, it's a, but there isn't like Sunday prayers. You know? But of course, if you're running what's actually a crypto-fascist movement, you want Nuremberg rallies. And so you have to create a collective act of worship that doesn't exist in the tradition. Secondly, why is the Ramayan the sacred text? The Ramayan is only one of many texts. Uh, there are many parts of India in which the Ramayan is not interesting. Why not the Rig Veda? You know, why not many, anybody can say, anybody in this room I'm sure can say many texts that are at least as central to the Hindu tradition as the Ramayan. The Ramayan isn't even the oldest text. You know, um, so that you, but in order to be this political movement, you have to have a unitary text. And anybody who deviates to the unitary text is blaspheming and must be stopped. And therefore, Ram. Why Ram? Of all the gods of India, why Ram? You know, um, as, we, as we know, I mean, Ram, after all, is only one of the incarnations of Vishnu, and the Vishnu thing is a big thing in India, but so is the Shiva thing. Why Ram? You know, why, I mean, in Bengal, why not Kali? In, in South India, why not Yelamma? You know, I mean, the, all over the country you go, there are gods who are popular and not popular, not necessarily Ram. So suddenly you have Ram Rajya, the Ramayan, and Nuremberg rallies. And that, crea <laughs> and that creates Hindu fascism. And, and that's what they're trying to do. That's what they're trying to do. And what she is saying is that's not Hinduism. Hinduism is this enormously disparate and diverse uh, group of beliefs, which you could in many ways separate into different religions. You know, I mean, you, you, I mean Shaivite worship, Vaishnavite worship, you know, it, they're, they're different things. Uh, yes, they all have a reverence for the same kinds, a group of sacred texts of which the Ramayana is by no means the most important. Why not the Bhagavad Gita? Why not, you know, why not all sorts of things? Um, and she's, her book is there to say, here is the diversity, the richness, the variety of Hinduism as it has actually existed. It is not this thing that we are now told is Hinduism. That's what they don't like. Because it, it, oppo it opposes their political project. Well, I mean, she's lucky in that she's in America. She's published to the University of Chicago. You know, the, her, she has no problem publishing her work. 
And, and this scandal has actually said, as I said, brought a little ex extra attention to her work. So, but of course, you know, again, to go come back to Bello, there's this famous sentence at the beginning of the adventures of Augie Marsh where he says, uh, you know, if you hold down one thing, you hold down the adjoining. You know, you, 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 to restrain freedom over here restrains freedom over here. You know? And it's tragic, I think, that this great scholar cannot have her work read, except on a Kindle, <laughs> in the country that she wrote it about, and has spent her life trying to understand. My recollection is more that something similar happened to you. Too. Yeah, it did. It did. <laughs> but, you know, I'm still here, and the Ayatollah Khomeini is not. <laughs> <laughs> there is that. <coughs> Where are we? Oh, there's, yeah. Actually, you know, just to respond to that also, what you had said, and then my question after that. Perhaps we in India and Pakistan don't like our religious traditions to be rich, whether they are Muslim, Hindu, mm. Buddhist, or whatever. Uh, we like life to be more simplified, perhaps. Mm. One of Wendy Doniger's points in the book is uh, that a lot of the way we approach our religion, the Hindu religion, uh, in India is what the British have bequeathed to us. And here lies the irony. You know, you've said such perceptive, such illuminating things, and I'm all with you on that. And the fact that you are a post-post-colonial also makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but a lot of us in the subcontinent are living still in the colonial era. And again, going back to something that you said earlier, that our laws are still in English. The irony here is that the very law that Wendy Doniger's uh, uh, opposers are uh, invoking in this case is a law that was made in 1861 it, by the British. Yeah, it's a colonial law. The blasphemy yeah. law in Pakistan was made by the British. Yes. And we are so rigidly following the colonial practices mm. to this day. Yeah. Your comments would be very No, I mean, I think that's just, it's just right. It's just mm. so, you know. And uh, it's a shame because, as I say, I think people's Everyday life of India has very little to do, people don't think about the British Empire anymore. And yet it is still there, enshrined in these codes that can be used against homosexuals, that can be used against literature, etc. You know, 377 is a colonial law as well. You know, so, so there is these terrible <laughs> problems which require a different breed of politician to deal with them. But unfortunately, we have this bunch of assholes. <laughs> you know? and, and what are we going to do with them? You know, because these are people of such either great weakness or great ruthlessness. They're certainly not ethical people or principled people or progressive people. You know, and and how do you, as a nation, progress if your leaders are of that kind? You know. Um, This is not only the case in India. There are other countries of the world which at various times one has been able to say that about their leaders, including this one. <laughs> um, maybe not right now, mm -hmm. uh, but in the very recent past. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's a problem. And I just, the th what worries me most is the attitude of the masses of India ranging from apathy towards an acceptance of the idea that you should prevent people saying things that offend people. I think there is unfortunately very broad acceptance of that idea. That the, the filmmaker, the scholar, the artist, the writer who is accused of offending people is blamed by most people for having done that. You know? It is not the fault of the bigot attacking him. It is his fault for having inflamed the bigot. You know? It's as if you were to annoy somebody who picked out, takes out a gun and kills you, and his defense is that you annoyed him. And that's a, and that's a complete defense. <laughs> that's a complete defense. Right? You could go to court and say, I killed him because he annoyed me. And they would say, oh, well, in that case, you know, there's the door. He deserved <laughs> you know, it. <laughs> you know, exactly. But this is the cockeyed situation in which you get into when you begin to affect, 
accept the offendedness argument. You know, you criminalize the innocent and you excuse the guilty. And this I do have some memory of, you know, uh, personal memory of. Um, there were an enormous number of people willing to say that I had brought the problem on my own head, you know, and that the people attacking me were justified, even though they were bombing bookstores, murdering translators, shooting publishers. That was okay, because I had, I was the criminal, you know, and this is the upside down world that India is now in. It, very broad acceptance of the idea that the person who rocks the boat, the person against whom the finger is pointed, is the guilty one. And that these Batras are innocent. You know, so if India doesn't unscramble that, then I fear for it. I genuinely fear for it in the future. There's a similar logic at work in the case of the, the horrible case of the woman that was raped by a gang of yes. guys. And some people who would have been sympathetic to the attempt to um, ban or to take Wendy's book out of, uh, Doniger's book out of circulation, made a similar argument that, that uh, she had, and I think you talked about this last mm. night, that she had, if she had she, been more yes. uh, circumscribed. She crossed the Lakshman Rekha. That's right. You know, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was exactly that. And it's, it's uh, appalling. You know, but I mean, it's, this is something we know about in the West too. There used to be many people in the West who would say, well, if you wear a mini skirt, you know, you're expecting to be raped. Right. You know, people have kind of stopped saying that. Uh, uh, but there, is, there was that attitude quite commonly expressed for a long time. Uh, and in India, it's still expressed. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what was she doing on a bus with men in the evening? After 7 p.m. She was on a bus with men. What does she expect? Mm. You know? She expects to go somewhere in a bus. That's what, she, that's, what, that's what she expects. And it's perfectly reasonable that she should take a bus rather than be. And you know, it has happened in India now. Women are scared of going out in the yeah, evening alone. Yeah. You know, it's, it's actually the case. After darkness, it's scary. Uh, and it would be nice, I think, if the Indian authorities, instead of pursuing books and films and writers, tried to protect women. You know, trying to protect with people who actually are in danger. Uh, because that, the terrible rape of the woman we're not allowed to name for reasons I don't accept. Um, I think not naming her is also a way of forgetting her. Mm. You know, yeah. uh, naming her is a way of remembering her and honoring her. And I think this whole business about how she must not be named, even though we all know what her name is, you know, uh, it's, it's, that's something weird about that. Uh, but, you know, since that case, there have been many cases, mm. in many cases. And then you get, I mean, I heard people from the BJP making this difference between India and Bharat, mm -hmm. right? So these rapes happen in India, mm. right? Westernized, decadent, degraded India where women feel they can go out after 7 p.m. on a bus. But they don't happen, allegedly, in Bharat, mm. traditional, India. Whereas actually one of the things we know is that it happens enormously in Indian villages. Mm -hmm. And we know that most of these crimes are crimes inside the family. You know, they're crimes committed by fathers or uncles or, you know, etc. And this is, and, and very often panchayats deal with them in the most harsh way. They give like a $50 fine, you know, 50 rupee fine, 100 rupee fine, you know, for raping your granddaughter, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, or they tell the woman that she should marry the man, mm. etc. I mean, this happens every day, happens every day in Bharat. You know? So this idea that this is because of Western practices having corrupted Indian women to behaving badly, mm. it's another of the pieces of bullshit that is everywhere right now. I mean, you can't go to India now without wading through bullshit that's waist deep. You know? And I really fear for the culture of this country. I really do, because uh, it needs such a clear, such a root and branch rethink. You know, we have to rethink the entire relationship between men and women um, in India, and to the disadvantage of the men. 
mm. you know, who are horrendously advantaged at the moment. Um, we have to rethink the whole question of liberty. You know, and who is to blame uh, in an assault of this kind? You know, who is to blame in an assault on a book? Who is to blame in an assault on a girl? You know? Who are the criminals and who are the innocent people? We've got this wrong. You know? And I think we have to start having that conversation in public. I mean, like this, we have to start yeah. talking about these things. In Bharata, if it, this could happen, how in Mahabharata, Draupadi was raped? Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's a little while ago, but <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying in the 21st century, it happens every day. It happens every day. Let's see, we have. What you said about Indian English reminds me of years ago the comment that my guru, my teacher that time. Dr. Cotright knows, mm. doc, late Dr. Fenton, yeah. what he said that Indian English is not particularly British English, it's a dialect. Mm. Yeah. It's a, and everywhere, because English is so versatile, whichever place it goes, it takes the color and the flavor mm. of that language. Mm. So I, I even <laughs> think the word dialect is, you know, has, carries connotations of secondary status. Mm. You yeah. Know? Um, and I wouldn't even call it that, you know. I think at this point, it's a pretty confident and assertive, mm -hmm. full-fledged language. Yes. You know, I mean, I, thrice quarter plate under trial, Eve teasing. <laughs> 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 well, probably what he meant you know, was the police um, encounter. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's, it's a pretty extensive language. By right, now. I believe so. <laughs> And the second thing uh, you said about um, that good literature, good means genuine literature, makes you think it should be thought provoking, <coughs> it should break some of the uh, status quo. Yeah. And, but where do you put then the biographical, uh, inspirational literature? Literature which inspires, literature which is uh, say in the during the Indian independence movement, mm. there are many many novels written by uh, Munshi Kanelal mm. Munshi. Mm -hmm. So some of that literature also yeah, of course. is very I mean, good. I'm not, say, I'm not saying that literature should only mm. question. Yeah, you know, I mean, some of the best novels written recently. I mean, for instance, take Vikram Seth, Suitable Boy. Mm. You know. Uh, neither formally nor in its content is it very radical. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's very long. <laughs> 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 um, but that's the most radical thing it does. You know, uh, it's actually a very classical, conventional piece of realist storytelling. You know, and and an extremely good one. Yes. You know, and certainly, if Vikram was sitting here, because Vikram and I have had this argument in public, he doesn't agree with me. You know, uh, my view is that literature happens at the edge, not in the middle. You know, my view is that, that original literature is, is created by artists who go to the boundaries and push outwards. You know, uh, Vikram doesn't think that's so. Vikram thinks you can sit in the center of the culture and create great beauty. You know, and, uh, and he's shown it, you know, in, in his own work. So, so the point is, there isn't ever one thing. Literature is many things. Subjective. Yes, it can be inspirational, it can be realist, naturalist, conservative, and excellent. You know, I mean, that, so there's, I'm not trying to say there's only one way to write. You know, that, that would be stupid. Uh, I'm just saying that that possibility must exist. You know, that, that, that many, if you look at any literature in any age, there are those artists who go to the edge and push. You know, when Osip Mandelstam wrote his poem about Stalin, he knew that Stalin wasn't going to like it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, and Stalin didn't like it, and he died in a labor camp, Mandelstam, you know. Um, but he still published the poem, you know. And, and uh, the history of literature is full of this, you know. 
Lorca was murdered by Franco's you know, goons because Lorca was opposed to the Falange. You know, um, and, but he didn't conceal the fact that he was opposed to the Falange. So if, if you look at, in any culture, any literature, you see how courageous writers have been in standing against the status quo, you know, when, when they don't believe in it, when they believe it to be wrong. Now, you don't have to. You don't have to. There's no rule which says you have to, you know. But you should be able to. You shouldn't be criminalized for doing so, you know. Even if this new BJP view of Hinduism now has very wide acceptance in India, which to an extent it does, because the BJP has been pushing it since the 70s, you know, and the BJP has its following. So, but even if that's so, that people, that many people, the large percentage of the Indian population that, that are BJP waras, you know, even if that's what they believe that Hinduism is and therefore they dislike what Wendy Doniger is saying, saying that it's something else, she must be able to say it. She must be able to say it. Um, even, if it was, even if the book was terrible, as it happens, it's a work of considerable scholarship. Even if it was a terrible book, she should have been able to say it. You can't only have freedom of speech for good books, you know. You have to have freedom of speech for crap as well, you know. Uh, and and uh, all of this is what I think people are very confused about in India now, you know, by, because of this wide acceptance of the idea that it's wrong to offend people, religious sensibility in particular. It's wrong to offend religious sensibility. Well, the European Enlightenment was based on offending religious sensibility. You know, when Diderot wrote The Nun, he did it because he knew it would piss off the Catholic Church. <laughs> uh, the, the whole point was to tell the Catholic Church with its inquisitions and anathemas and so on, that it would no longer be allowed to place limiting points on thought. You know, and, and it was the defeat of the Catholic church by the enlightenment that makes possible the present idea of freedom of speech. The battle was not fought against the state, it was fought against the church. You know? And now, different church, same battle. I'm mindful we're out of, we're out of time, right? Uh, it's, that, it's like that with conversations with you. I talk too much. No, no, <laughs> the time flies by. It's <laughs> The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.